So one of the big things that we had to do pretty much right off the bat was making sure that our data scientists were able to get access to the data at scale, the scale at which the company was operating at, and be able to build the models in time so that the model maps to the future and it performs well for the future, which is what we all care about. Like We don't care how well our models perform to history. We want our models to perform well for the future. Welcome to How AI Happens, a podcast where experts explain their work at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. You'll hear from AI researchers, data scientists, and machine learning engineers as they get technical about the most exciting developments in their field and the challenges they're facing along the way. I'm your host, Rob Stevenson, and we're about to learn how AI happens. Here with me today on How AI Happens is the Vice President of Engineering over at Credit Karma, Vishnu Ram. Vishnu, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Glad to be here. It's a great day outside. I'm glad to be recording this with you, Rob. Where exactly are you based? I am based out of California Bay Area. Oh, lovely. So the fog hasn't quite rolled in yet. Sounds like it's sunny and lovely there. Yep. Wonderful. Well, great day for a podcast, as it turns out. I'm so excited to have you on, Vishnu. There's lots for us to speak about. But before we get into your experience building data teams, alleviating technical debt, setting up data culture, all that great stuff, let's just get to know you a little bit. Would you mind sharing with me and the folks out there in podcast land a little bit about your background and how you came to be in this current role at Credit Karma? Yeah. So I've been at Credit Karma for close to nine years now. Prior to Credit Karma, I was in India. I was doing a bunch of startups where I was doing like early stage CTO roles there. Thankfully, a couple of them are unicorns at this point of time. And that's where I really cut my teeth in engineering leadership and starting to play around with early data technologies outside of the cloud and even like just getting started with the cloud. Then once I moved into Credit Karma is when I started being able to play around and like build teams to play around with a lot more data, building products which impacts more than 100 million, 120 million members at Credit Karma. So it's been it's been a long journey. And prior to my work experience, I definitely had some amount of exposure to AI in the form of fuzzy logic and neural networks in my undergrad and master's. And it's like I had an opportunity to go deeper into neural networks. I decided not to at that point of time, which I kind of regret, but it's fine. It's worked out okay for me. What made you want to turn away from neural networks at that moment? I think there's a very clear recognition that the impact that you could have outside in the industry, if you go deep into neural networks, is just not there. And I'm talking about a time frame when we didn't have the data capabilities or the compute capabilities that we all just completely take for granted today. I see. Why do you say you regret it? Is it because we've kind of caught up to the the technical limits of the time? We've definitely caught up to the technical limits of the time, but I think I would have had an opportunity to have been much earlier from a research perspective and like have an opportunity to learn more of the foundational aspects much earlier than I think I would have been in, out here at Credit Karma so far. Surely there's an opportunity to inject some of that into uh, the proceedings over at Credit Karma now with the scale that you're at, right? Oh, definitely. I think that's been part of my journey over here over the last seven, eight years now. So I think the opportunities that have come my way and come our company's way, I think we've used it really well from an AI perspective. We have always had ambitious things that we wanted to do for our members. And I think we've been able to do that with AI. Now, do you wish this had been injected earlier? Or do you think you need to reach a certain scale with the team and the business before it was appropriate? I think right from the point in time that I joined the company, we definitely had opportunities at that point in time. But to be able to inject AI, to be able to do it at scale, to be able to do the cutting edge that we have today, we needed to go through a journey And part of the journey was getting our data organized, making sure that we are able to use the right technologies, making sure that we were in the cloud. A lot of those pieces we had to figure out along the way, making sure that we had the right teams with the right skill sets in the right areas, just getting our organization ready, getting our technology stack ready. So a bunch of different things that we needed to do before we were able to get to AI at scale. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's part of why I was excited to chat with you, Bishnu, because 
you have been with Credit Karma nine years, which is an eternity in startup years. And because of that, you've really seen the organization grow in a meaningful way. Now, Credit Karma at this point, I'm sure the folks out there listening are very aware of what Credit Karma does. Nine years ago, maybe not so much the case. I would love to for you to kind of walk us through the journey of building Credit Karma into the data science operation it is currently. Can we maybe start with what things looked like when you began at Credit Karma? How did you take stock of the operation and figure out how to make sense of the data plan there? Yeah, I think when I joined Credit Karma nine, eight, nine years back, it was already operating at scale. We had 20, 25 million users at that point of time. What that meant was we were already delivering a very, very valuable service for all of these users. That's why we kept growing, we kept growing, we kept growing, and we had like more than 120 million users today. So what that meant was the basic footprint in terms of product market fit at scale was already there. The other big thing from a data perspective that was also there was our founding team and our leadership team were all very data centric. They always wanted to use data to make their decisions. There were models in place, which we were using to deliver certain experiences to our members. One of the things that we've always cared about is making sure that when we are recommending any financial products in front of our users, we provide them with a sense of certainty. I can go back We talk about this quite a bit, but I can go back to my own college experience where I came from India, I came to the country, and then we were applying for uh, credit cards willy-nilly, like, I get a t-shirt here, I get a t-shirt there, okay, show me where to sign, and we were just (laughs) applying for credit cards. And at that point of time, I did not have the background to understand that, like, hey, I could be hurting my credit score, I could be hurting my credit report in a bad way. And I just did that. And then it took me a few months to realize and then some lessons from my seniors telling me that like, hey, don't do it this way, do that this way, right? I didn't have credit karma at my fingertips when I came to the country. And which is something that a lot of new folks starting to deal with their credit get access to. And right from the beginning, this is like something that is very central for credit karma, providing certainty. And we had models in place which were helping our members do that. But to be able to do that at scale where when we kept adding more products, when we kept adding more users, we needed to get our data to work better. So there was a point in time when our data science teams to build a model, they would have to work one month over weekends to bring the data together into a training data set, which then they could use to build a model. So in today's time, it's it's probably like completely like a joke because we know that our data changes every week. If our data changes every week and if you're taking a month to put together a training data set for a model, that's just not going to work. Your model is already out of date by the time you have got your training data set together. Forget building a model and testing it and making it ready, ramping it as an experiment and all of that. So one of the big things that we had to do pretty much right off the bat was making sure that our data scientists were able to get access to the data at scale, the scale at which the company was operating at, and be able to build the models in time so that the model maps to the future and performs well for the future, which is what we all care about. Like We don't care how well our models perform to history. We want our models to perform well for the future. So that was probably like one of the biggest things that we had to take care of. And to do that, we had to make a lot of investments in our uh, data engineering capabilities. It was one of the pivotal investments that we had to make from a technology perspective was to go and start using Google BigQuery at that point in time. So once we were able to go to Google BigQuery, then Google provided us a way to scale our scale to our requirements in terms of how we are pulling together data into a training data set. Maybe I'll stop there. I can keep adding more based on questions that you have, but maybe I'll stop there. Sure. Well, it seems to me obvious that having your data professionals have access to data upon which the company is making decisions, right? That seems pretty straightforward. Is that not often the case? You would find that surprisingly true, where in a lot of organizations, as they keep scaling, this is kind of like an afterthought. I think in today's world, it might be different. But to a large extent, you want to first build your product. 
to be able to deliver an experience for your users. There's a lot of focus on that. Then you want to make sure that your product is reliable and scalable. And a lot of the things with respect to data and modeling kind of comes a little bit after that. I know things keep changing, but it's hard to do that right up front because then you're trying to add an initial friction or cost to launch your product and get it to product market fit. So for that reason, more often than not, your companies as they are scaling, their investments in data, their investments in data engineering and data science kind of lag the investments that they make in building products and bringing it in front of users, making it reliable. I'd love to hear you opine a little bit on the nature of technical debt, because that's sort of what you're alluding to when there's not access to data on this scale. Okay, now the models won't be accurate. They won't ship in time, et cetera. Can one foresee coming technical debt or is it the kind of thing that you have to go to the mountaintop yourself, feel the friction, and then you can build in processes to alleviate it moving forward? Yeah, so I think one of the easiest ways to get a sense of technical debt is take one of Google's products or AWS's products or Azure's products and then say you want to try to build it in-house yourself. And then you'll get a really good sense of the technical debt because a lot of these products have included in them years of learning, years of best practices that get incorporated into the product. So when you start trying to recreate it yourself, what you're going to see is that you're capturing maybe only like 10% of the overall features that they have built. So the rest of the 90% you've not built it. Now, when you not built the rest of the 90%, what then happens is you need to start compensating with people or processes. And then when you start compensating with people or processes, you could probably do it for a certain amount of time, for a certain number of people, for a certain number of users that you're supporting. But once the users start scaling, once the amount of time that you've been dealing with it increases, once your own team size starts growing is when you'll start seeing the pinch when you'll start feeling the sense of like, hey, what are the 90% that I need to take care of? So you could make a decision to say that like, I know what I'm doing. And if I know what I'm doing, then I can say, hey, I'll capture the right 10% at the right time. But you're making a bet on yourself and your team that you'll capture the right 10% at the right time to be able to make sure that your technology platform can keep scaling with the needs of your business. When you say compensating with people or processes, how is that different than normal business growth that would be expected and or desired? Yeah, I think you're always going to have to do it. I mean, I put it in a way where it's like you should not do it. That's not what I really mean. What I mean is that you want to do it, but you want to do it carefully in a thoughtful manner. Are you deliberating and are you making that as a thoughtful piece of your decision making process in terms of prioritizing where you're investing, when you're investing? Or are you just like letting it flow? I think that's the way I would put it. You want to take on technical debt at the right points in time that allows you to continue to make the right prioritization decisions at the right time. I see. So fast forwarding a little bit now, nine years on, how would you describe the data culture of Credit Karma, if it's okay to use a term like data culture? Yeah, so I think like I had mentioned earlier, a lot of companies and organizations have issues in just getting support from leadership when it comes to making the right investments at the right time as far as data and AI are concerned. One of the benefits that I've had and my teams have had is like we've always had consistent support from our founding team to go after the right things at the right time. And then the next part of it is from a data culture perspective is looking at some of the aspects of data, like data engineering and data science, and understanding the nuances which makes it different from software engineering, and which also understanding the state of the art in terms of tools and processes that are available in software engineering is very different from that in data engineering and data science. So once you know the gaps in in the market, know the gaps in tooling, know the gaps in processes, then you're going to have to like wait actually to some extent for some of those processes and tooling to catch up. So in our in our case, I can probably bring up our adoption of TensorFlow, for example. So our adoption of TensorFlow was when TensorFlow didn't exist, we were trying to jury rig our own 
machine learning framework and patterns and practices on top of Spark internally. And then uh, we were trying to get our data science to start using it. And then once TensorFlow started coming out, we started following how TensorFlow was being developed by Google. And then we just decided to go and make a big bet on TensorFlow. So then what happened at that point of time was like our data scientists felt like really comfortable because it's one, it was coming, it was backed by Google. Second, it was an open source. And third, we were able to adopt a platform like that in close collaboration with data engineering and data science. So that I would say is a big part of our culture where whenever we want to introduce like new platforms or frameworks, we find both the teams that own that framework as well as the teams that are going to use that framework or platform to just like work together to build it up from scratch. And we've seen a lot of success in not just in data, but also in other areas as far as our engineering organization is concerned. Is the risk of not doing it that way a process that is not useful or meaningful or or shelfware? What what is the risk of not having this sort of multi team approach? It could be all of the above, right? I think there are obvious pros and cons to doing it. One con to what I suggested was you are going to have to go a little slow at the beginning. So there have been instances where we wanted to operate at speed, where we would just go and build quickly. But then have a very clear thought process that like, hey, the way we are building, we are actually have the potential of this becoming shelfware. So we would create natural points at which we want to involve folks from the other teams to come in and start working with us on that. And I think we've had more successes in rolling out some of these platforms and frameworks within the data world because we have either worked along with our consumers right early Because the consumers actually, in some situations, they know more than you do in terms of what they want. And they have been like doing their own research. So you have to rely. I mean, if if your consumers have done their own research, then no brain, it's a no brainer to start including them because they're going to help you see you around the corner and make sure that you're making the right decisions at the right time. I'd love to hear more about the process of adopting TensorFlow. I just love to know what it looks like, Vishnu, when For example, you and your team are whiteboarding. Okay, how do we actually inject this in a meaningful way? Who are the stakeholders? Who do we need to connect together? What does this look like internally when you start plugging something like this in? Yeah, I think especially with respect to TensorFlow, the way we went about it was we were having conversations with our data science teams and trying to understand some of the challenges that they were facing. And it was very clear that the way we were going about developing our own infrastructure and the way we were trying to like get data science to start using that infrastructure was just not working. There were a lot of challenges. We had made a bit on Scala. We said like, hey, we, it's like data scientists are going to write a small amount of code. It doesn't matter whether they write it in Scala or Python. So let's just get them to use what we are building, but let's get them to write Scala code. And then once we started the process, then we started getting feedback from the team. And this is a team which had a lot of R background. It's not like they were like predominantly Python, especially the time frame when we started rolling it out. And then once we got a lot of this feedback after a few months of working with our data science team, we realized that this is not the answer. We need to go back to the drawing board and start figuring out a different answer. And around this time, some of us had already been following how TensorFlow was growing and how Google was developing TensorFlow. It's still very, very early. And I have a bunch of TensorFlow Dev Summit t-shirts lying around that my daughters just keep wearing it nowadays. I don't get to wear <laughs> them at all now. But this is when TensorFlow was doing like Dev Summits in person. It was hard to get into those Dev Summits. And like we were, some of us were able to get into those Dev Summits very, very early on. And we realized where the TensorFlow team was going to take this to. And we realized that there were problems that we were talking internally that Google was already solving for us. And given that we were already like on BigQuery and we were going to start taking like a big bet on Google Cloud as well for everything that we do from an infrastructure perspective, it was easy for us to say, hey, let's just go and start using TensorFlow. And then around that time, Google had also published this paper of TensorFlow Extended. They had not open sourced everything about TensorFlow Extended, but they published this TensorFlow Extended. And I I have a very clear memory where 
I looked at that paper. It came out over a weekend or something like that. I looked at it over the weekend and then I just like, oh, the weekend I sent it to the core working team. We just created like a core working team involving both data engineers and data scientists and sent it to the team and said like, hey, this is what we want to build. This is what we've been talking about. Now, Google has published this. Now, let's maybe start learning from how TensorFlow Extended is working and then look at what is out there, look at what we need to build and then start building it. But one of the earliest things that we also did was scary to talk about at this point of time was also understand what our initial use cases of the new framework would be. We already had in mind how we were going to use this new TensorFlow based framework to go and deliver value for business and our members. And that was a pretty big deal because we had to figure out how we're going to train models. We had to figure out how these models are going to get scored in production. So once we had a little bit of a sense of confidence that like, hey, we're going to be able to train these models well on top of TensorFlow, then we needed to scramble and get our production serving production because I'm not talking about offline scoring at all. I'm talking about online scoring of models in real time for our users. That's the use cases that we wanted to go and deliver. So then I had to go and quickly get my production serving, model serving team incorporated very, very quickly as part of the working team. So then the working team slowly starts expanding. And then when the production model serving teams gets involved, they're going to figure out like, hey, I have requirements from our platform engineering team to be able to support it. And then you start making sure that you are sharing your thought process, you're sharing the big win that you're going to achieve for the business. That's why it was important for us to land the use cases early. Then you are able to then get the right amount of support from the rest of the business to be able to go do something like it. And we did that in a very, very short amount of time, I would say, for the kind of changes that we were making. It was like at that time, it was like around a couple of quarters that we promised and we were able to deliver that in time. And it ended up being a big business win for the company. We, we did like a lot of internal sessions of how we were able to get this from scratch to running in production. And it's probably something that I'm just going to remember for the rest of my life, how we went about doing it uh, and how, I mean, I'm just like really grateful for the team that I get to work with when, when we do these kind of projects together. So in this case, mapping the need for the new model to a business use case it sounds like it was almost a little bit of internal PR. Like it was probably clear to, to you and, and your team and some of the more technical folks that this was important. But this is a business. It exists to make money and serve customers, right? Serve users. You want to put things in terms of how it helps the whole business, right? So was that merely internal PR or just to, to help get buy-in or did it help with the actual entirety of the implementation, technically speaking? So... I think the internal education when you are moving away from logistic random forests and other logistic models into neural networks, the internal education I think is really critical because you are letting go of some aspects of what you're going to get from models, but you're going to gain a lot more in terms of business performance. And like given if you have a leadership team, if you have a lot of people aware of how data works, then you're not trying to start from scratch. They are already educated. So then at that point of time, if you need to add a little bit more in terms of education, it's on you to do it well. I think that's important. You can't let them stay where they are. You need them to also get up to speed in terms of what you're trying to do, where you expect this to go. You need to have a sense of it. I think having that sense and then taking a little bit of effort to go and do that has always just like paid dividends for us. Some of this is also based on learnings, right? From previous projects that we did. When we did not do it, we could see at the end of it, when we do a retro, we're going to say, hey, if only we had done this education process a little bit better, we would have had a better chance of success or we would have had like a much smoother ramp up. More often than not, the technical delivery lands. That's what we have seen because we have strong engineers and teams working on these projects. The technical delivery lands, but you need to make sure that post the technical delivery, you're able to ramp it up to scale so that it meets the needs of the business. So that's where I think more often than not, like the education helps us get more support from other teams is the way I think about it. 
do you want that support do you don't want that support sometimes you think you don't need that support but most times you end up needing support and that's why that initial little bit of effort on the education just goes a long way yeah definitely and it's so interesting this is quite unrelated to your previous experience working in data science to your previous university coursework in neural networks, right? This is leadership. This is management. This is like navigating inside of a business to accomplish goals that help everyone. And I I think I'm calling this out because for folks out there who may be individual contributors right now, but they want to get into a role like yours, into a management director, VP kind of role, this is really important that they get this stuff right. As you just called out, you had the technical talent in spades to execute on something like this. But that's not all it takes to get a huge project like this across the table or across the finish line. Could you speak a little bit more on that shift from having the technical talent as an individual contributor into management where you're now thinking of more organizational wide challenges? Yeah. So one of the things, like even coming from my background, like I talked about me starting out as early stage engineering leader back in India. And when I was doing that, I did not have any other engineering peers that I needed to work with. I could just sit with the founding team, make the right decision, and then it's just a small team. We would move fast and we would just get things done. So in that case, the communication piece is just with the founding team, with the engineers, and maybe a couple of people on product or marketing, and then you're done. Once your organization starts scaling, say 30, 40, 50, 100, 200, 500,000, is when you need to figure out how to start improving your communication aspects of how you build and deploy and scale things. And if you are not able to do it, more often than not, you will find different teams working at cross purposes. They are not trying to do things which are good for the business. Everyone operates with good intent. It's not like teams and engineers or data scientists or marketers don't operate with good intent. Everyone is operating with good intent, but they just don't know that like, am I rowing in this direction or am I going backward? I'm going sideways. Like which direction are you rowing? Is This becomes a problem. Where are we heading? I think that becomes a big problem. And it's important for everyone to understand that communication gets harder and harder and harder. And when communication gets harder, it becomes most important for you to assume good intent. It becomes most important for you to share more, just communicate more. And you might feel that the other team or the other person, they don't really need to know, learn about it. But the fact that you took that time to share it with them, that will create the right culture because then they are also going to say, oh yeah, I get information from team x about what they are doing i know that they could be interested in information that i am doing as well let me share that also so once you have the process of like communicating out and then receiving and then listening then you're going to be able to fix or make the right course corrections much earlier otherwise you are going to make those course corrections only when say two boats have just like crashed into each other right so and then when two boats have crashed into each other guess what it's really really hard to have good intent at that point of time you're going to think that team was really trying to actively sabotage your plans but that is not the thing at all the other team was also trying to do its job of like with good intent to take the business to a better place so but it's hard to do it when you're crashing into each other at all times so that's where i think some of the communication aspects really come to play well Yeah, that makes sense. That's tremendous advice, Vishnu. And I'm going to ask you for a little bit more advice before I let you go. For the folks out there who are working on data teams within their own companies, data scientists, what advice would you give them to make sure that they are participating or helping create a data culture resulting in clean, usable, high quality data? I mean, the biggest thing that I've personally learned, and I think this is something that I learned very, very early on when Uh, in the company that I worked in, one of my CTOs told me, I was building a network management system product and my CTO told me, you have to go and sit next to the users of the product. Sit next to the users, just watch what they are doing, just talk to them, just get comfortable talking to them. And I think that's one message that I'm never going to forget. And in all our roles, it's really hard to do that all the time. You have to find equivalent proxies of doing that 
And the one way that I talk to my teams about that is think about what you're building. Think about whether it's a model or a system or a service. Think about the problem that you're solving. When that problem gets solved, imagine how that will impact the end user or the team or the company. Just make sure that you're able to imagine that. If you're able to imagine that, guess what? You're going to find better ways of solving the problems or you'll find better problems to solve, which is much, much more powerful. And I think that's one thing. And it doesn't matter where you are in your career. It doesn't matter what title you have. It doesn't matter which function you are in. To be able to do that well just gives you superpowers. That is great advice. I don't think we're going to find a better bookend for this episode than than getting superpowers. So at this point, Vishnu, I would just say thank you so much for joining the show. This has been a fantastic conversation. I really have loved speaking with you today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rob. How AI Happens is brought to you by Sama. Sama provides accurate data for ambitious AI, specializing in image, video, and sensor data annotation and validation for machine learning algorithms in industries such as transportation, retail, e-commerce, media, medtech, robotics, and agriculture. For more information, head to Sama.com.